Good evening, Olympus colleagues, valued urologist partners, and customers from around the world. Wherever you may be tonight, however you may be listening or viewing, thank you so much for making us part of your day. My name is Brian Schneider, and I'm joined by Mike Rondinelli and Tommy Griffiths. We are your Olympus hosts for this evening's webinar. We are part of the Olympus commercial team for Soltiv, the world's very first uh, super pulsed thulium fiber laser. Soltiv is indicated for the surgical treatment of renal calculi, as well as soft tissue applications, including the vaporization and enucleation of prosthetic tissue. Please note this disclaimer. Uh, before I introduce this evening's physician speaker, Dr. Bojani, I have three brief announcements. Number one, we have over 200 registered attendees tonight. Due to the size of this virtual audience, we will have everyone on mute except for our speaker and the Olympus hosts. Number two, this event is for approximately one hour. We may go a few minutes over and will be recorded. This presentation content, which includes several endoscopic videos, should take approximately 45 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. If you do have a question during, please use the Q&A chat feature on the software. This is located on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Now, during the video playback of the many endoscopic videos we have for you this evening, we may have an opportunity to cover questions as we go, so please enter them as we progress. And to encourage engagement with the audience, all questions from the audience will remain anonymous. And lastly, for optimal viewing of case video, expand your screen using the bottom right-hand corner expansion icon on the media player window when it populates. With that out of the way, let's get started. It has been approximately 10 months since the launch of Soltiv into the North American market. Many U.S. and Canadian physicians have made public their extremely high praise of Soltiv, both in traditional and social media, for the treatment of stones. From a fast adoption rate, we project Soltiv to be the market leader in the surgical treatment of renal stones in a very short amount of time. And while stone feedback and experience has been abundant, enucleation feedback has been very limited by comparison to a to a, due to a much smaller pool of surgeons embracing this technique. This select group, many of whom are on the call tonight, will agree that prostate enucleation is the gold standard in the surgical treatment of BPH, independent of laser modality. They will also agree enucleation has a steep learning curve relative to other BPH surgical approaches. And in order to embrace a specific laser technology in your enucleation practice, you need the right technique and, more importantly, the right guidance. So uh, tonight's speaker, physician speaker and Soltiv Enucleation Champion, helps us fill this feedback and guidance need. Our speaker is a rising star in the international urology community with a strong reputation fueled by his thought leadership with enucleation. Like many of today's high-profile prostate enucleation surgeons, he did his residency at the Indiana University under one of the procedure's pioneers, Dr. James Ligaman. Uh, in 2013, this physician was recruited by the University of Montreal to develop comprehensive kidney stone and BPH programs. Today, he holds the title of associate professor and clinical researcher there. He, was pu he has published extensively in stone disease and BPH while maintaining a full practice where he has completed over 1,000 prostate enucleations to date, also the recipient of various awards recognizing both his academic and his clinical achievements. I present to you one of the world's leading experts in prostate enucleation, Dr. Naheem Bojani of the University of Montreal. Excellent. Thank you so much, Brian. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, thank you to Olympus for organizing this webinar. I want to thank everybody who's uh, attending the webinar. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to share my experience uh, with SOTI, Thulium Fiber Laser Enucleation of the Prostate. Uh, so we're going to get started. Here's the plan of my presentation. Uh, so first, we're going to talk about the technology. Uh, how does uh, Solti Thulium Fiber Laser work? Uh, we'll then compare it to the uh, new uh, to the Homium YAG laser. We'll then move on to BPH surgical management, focusing specifically on enucleation, and then we'll finish off with a Solti Thulium Fiber Laser enucleation of the prostate with video support. So first of all, probably most importantly, we need to talk about the technology. So uh, as urologists, we're faced with new technology every day. Uh, especially in, in BPH. Uh, and so we need to understand the advantages and the disadvantages of these new technologies so that we can get the best outcomes for our patients. So along those same lines, we have this uh, first slide I wanted to show you. I think it's really important to understand that thulium fiber laser technology is not the same thing as thulium YAG. So thulium YAG is uh, a technology that came out in the early 2000s 
Uh, it's exclusively used uh, for PPH. It's a laser that's very similar to the Holmium YAG, very similar wavelengths. The big difference is that the Thulium YAG is a continuous laser, whereas the Holmium YAG is a pulsed laser. And this is very different from the Thulium fiber laser. So we're gonna look at uh, the technology behind the Thulium fiber laser now. So what's the interest, first of all, in the Thulium fiber laser? Uh, first of all, it has um, you know, a high power outage. Uh, it has excellent um, hemostasis, has a high frequency up to over 2000 Hertz. Uh, you can also lower the energy quite significantly. Uh, and it's a very small laser, uh, it's very stable. Uh, and uh, so we're gonna get into now the details of how this laser works. So if you look at the inside of the laser box, next slide, Brian, um, you have within the box of the laser, you have this long laser fiber. Now this is not the surgical fiber that we use in the patient. This is a long laser fiber within the uh, box of the laser. Uh, and at the, this is a 10 to 30 meter uh, fiber. And at the core of this fiber is dotted with thulium ion. Now, next slide, so next slide. Along the entire core, you have these thulium ions. And to activate these thulium ions, we use a diode laser. So this diode laser activates these thulium ions. And then once the thulium ions are activated, it then gets inserted into a surgical fiber, which is then used uh, inside the patient. Now, before we go on to compare this to the Homium YAG, I need to mention here that there's two lasers uh, that are available from Olympus. The first is the Soltiv Premium, and the other is the Soltiv Pro. Uh, there is a significant difference between the two. The Premium has a uh, laser, highest laser energy output of six joules compared to four joules. Uh, laser frequency for the Premium goes up above 2,000 hertz, whereas with the Pro, it only goes to 100 hertz. And then finally, uh, average power is 60 watts with the Premium versus 35 watts with the Pro. If you want to be able to do an enucleation procedure, you're going to want the Premium, uh, because you're going to use those uh, 60 watts. So now we're going to compare the uh, new thulium fiber laser to uh, Holmium YAG. So um, just uh, a little reminder, the Holmium YAG laser uh, is actually formed uh, by different cavities. So if you want a low-powered uh, laser, a low-powered Holmium YAG laser, that's a 30-watt laser, you're going to have to have uh, a, um, a flash lamp, which, gonna, which is going to emit photons, which are going to activate homium ions on a crystal. It'll then pass through a number of mirrors, and then you will have your laser, which will then enter into a laser fiber. Now, if you want a high-powered homium YAG laser, you're going to actually need four of those cavities to create a 120-watt laser. Now, the problem here is twofold. First is that because you need four cavities, the laser is uh, significantly larger. And the second problem is you're using a number of flash lamps here, which create a lot of heat. And so you need a refrigeration system or a cooling system. Uh, and this, again, will increase the size of the laser and, more importantly, will cause an extreme amount of noise. And these are things we don't have with the thulium fiber laser. The thulium fiber laser is very small, uh, very compact, and um, doesn't make any noise. Uh, so let's look into some other differences between the two lasers. So the thulium fiber laser gives you a very homogeneous laser compared to the Homium YAG laser due to the mirrors that are used. As you can see on the left here, it's not a very homogeneous laser. Um, it still it works well, but it's not as efficient as the thulium fiber laser. Another issue that we have is that with the Homium YAG laser, next slide, uh, there's a number of mirrors, uh, as you know, uh, and these mirrors need to be perfectly aligned and sometimes need to be repaired and are uh, sometimes also fragile. And that, that's something that you don't have again with the thulium fiber laser. Let's go into uh, more of the clinical details. Uh, oh, ergonomics first real quickly. So as you all know, the Homium YAG laser requires a special uh, plug, a special um, outlet uh, to be able to use the laser. Whereas with the thulium fiber laser, you can use basically any uh, outlet. Um, so overall, uh, it's a much smaller laser. As you can see here on this cart, you have your uh, sole teeth thulium fiber laser, and you also have your shock bolts. Uh, and again, you can plug it into the wall. You have a nice interface, as you can see here, flat panel. Uh, it's, it's like an iPhone, basically, you know, very easy to use. Um, you can save your parameters. Um, so, so very, very user-friendly, uh, and uh, the ergonomics, obviously, are, are great for this new laser. Um, next slide. So um, now we're going to compare the details of the parameters. So the Homium YAG laser, as mentioned, uh, and the thulium fiber laser both go up to six joules in terms of energy output. Uh, however, the thulium fiber laser can go down to 0.25 joules 
which is much lower than the homium YAG laser. And this becomes important when you want to do dusting for stone disease uh, because you want to increase that frequency, but you want to lower the energy so that your total power outage is about the same as you would have with the homium YAG laser. Uh, the next parameter is frequency. Um, so the highest frequency you can get with the high-powered homium YAG laser is 80 uh, hertz. Uh, with a thin fiber laser, you can get up uh, above 2,000 hertz. Um, Next uh, is the pulse width. Um, so uh, we can get a significantly longer pulse width with the thulium fiber laser. And as you can see uh, in this picture, it is also, again, much more hom homogeneous compared to the homium YAG laser. And this becomes important when we talk about hemostasis, which we'll get to later on in the video. Um, another really important difference is the depth of penetration. So here, if you look at zero millimeters, 100% of the energy of the homium YAG laser and 100% of the energy of the thulium fiber laser is transmitted to tissue. However, when you get to 0 0.3 millimeters, there's still a third of the homium YAG energy that is transmitted to tissue, whereas with the thulium fiber laser, there's basically no more energy transmitted. So the, uh, although the homium YAG laser is, has a shallow depth of penetration, the thulium fiber laser is actually even more shallow. Um, we're going to move on now to uh, comparing the thulium fiber laser to the new uh, homium YAG MOSIS technology. Uh, so first of all, obviously the plug, again, you can plug the homium, uh, the uh, Solti thulium fiber laser into any outlet, where you can't do that with the MOSIS technology uh, and the homium YAG laser. Pulse energy, again, the new MOSIS technology does not go below 0.2 joules. And weight, of course, is a significant difference between the two. And of course, finally, uh, frequency. Again, even though it has MOSIS technology, the frequency can't get any higher than 80 hertz. Lastly, we're going to talk um, uh, a couple of things about um, uh, ureteral damage. So this is a nice study from Dr. Uh, ben Chu and Dr. Knudsen looking at ureteral damage in pigs using different parameters and comparing the homium YAG to the sole teeth to fiber laser. And uh, it did, with different parameters, there's really no difference in damage to these pig ureters. Uh, and also, if you go to the next slide, there's a number of abstracts looking at the uh, temperature rise uh, when we use these lasers. Uh, and the bottom line is, as long as your power outage is the same between the homium YAG and the salty thulium fiber laser, the rise in temperature is the same as well. So even if you increase that frequency 200, 300, or 400, as long as you keep that energy low uh, and your power outage is the same as the homium YAG, you're not going to increase your uh, temperature any more than you would with the homium YAG laser. Very importantly, if you look at the light spectrum, the wavelength of the salty thulium fiber laser uh, seems to be very close to the wavelength of the homium YAG laser, as you can see here. However, if you look at the peak absorption uh, in water of these lasers, um, the uh, thulium fiber laser is actually at the peak of, uh, next slide, Brian, uh, the, the thulium fiber laser is at the peak of absorption uh, in water uh, compared to the homium YAG laser. And actually, it's 4.5 times more absorbed in water than the homium YAG laser. And this is extremely important when we get to, again, hemostasis, which we'll talk about later on in the presentation when we get to the videos. Okay, so we're going to move on now to uh, salty thulium fiber laser technology for uh, BPH. So the rest of my presentation is going to focus on enucleation. However, there are some uh, urologists who are doing vaporization. So this would be salty thulium fiber laser ablation of the prostate. Uh, and what they're doing is a possible combination of vapo-enucleation and uh, vaporization. Um, I'd like to mention that, uh, as you can see, the salty thulium fiber is an end fire laser. Currently, there is no data uh, behind this uh, technique. Uh, and currently, what's being used is 3 joules uh, and 20 hertz. Um, this is not something that I have done yet. Uh, and so we're going to focus now on salty thulium fiber laser enucleation of the prostate. So um, as you all know, uh, and in my opinion, enucleation is the best treatment for BPH. Um, if you go to the next slide, so Dr. Gilling, you know, first, um, uh, you know, uh, coined this term and, and started enucleation in 1998. Uh, and since then, we have a tremendous amount of level one evidence that shows that enucleation is better uh, than uh, TURP, better than open simple prostatectomy. We have good durable data up to 18 years of follow-up that demonstrate that the re-intervention re rate is extremely low, under 1%. Enucleation provides pathological specimen, 
Uh, even now with MRIs and biopsies, uh, we still have a positivity rate of between 8 and 10% after enucleation. Uh, enucleation has been found to be extremely safe, very low complication rate, very cost effective. The laser fiber, the scope, the Morse layer, the Morse layer blades are all reusable. Uh, it can be done in patients who are anticoagulated, uh, and in the end, it's prostate size independent. You can do a 30 gram prostate just like you can do a 300 gram prostate. So when Dr. Gilling um, started doing enucleation, he started with the homium YAG laser. So that is uh, currently considered the gold standard for enucleation. However, since this time, uh, individuals have done enucleation with bipolar plasma kinetic energy, thulium YAG laser energy, uh, diode laser energy. Uh, there's even people doing green light laser enucleation of the prostate. And now we have soul teeth, thulium fiber laser enucleation of the prostate. Next slide. So there are uh, a couple of drawbacks of enucleation. Uh, so if you speak to anybody who doesn't do enucleation, they're going to mention two main things. One is the length of the procedure, and the second is the learning curve. So length of the procedure has frequently been reported as a problem. However, if you look at the mean tissue retrieval rate, so that's grams per minute uh, between holep and terp, it's actually comparable. Uh, the long procedure is really due to the significantly more amount of tissue that we remove uh, with enucleation. And this is demonstrated by the significantly greater drop in postoperative PSA. And then learning curve. So if you look at the literature, learning curve is between 20 and 30 cases. Uh, but uh, I truly believe that if enucleation was taught during residency as TERP is taught, uh, this really wouldn't be an issue. So we're going to move on now to my experience. So as mentioned, I did two years uh, with Dr. Lingaman in Indianapolis where I learned HOLEP. Uh, since then, I've been back at the University of Montreal for the past seven years. I've performed over a thousand HOLEPs. But I've always been someone who's tried to improve my technique, uh, either change the technique uh, or, you know, use new technology to get better outcomes for my patients. And last year, uh, I felt that bleeding was more of an issue than I would have liked with my HOLEPs. It's not to say that I had more transfusions. The transfusion rate is extremely low. My transfusion, my transfusion rate is under 1%. Uh, but I still felt like I had to do a lot of hemostasis, uh, and I didn't appreciate that. And so uh, last year, I, I decided to try green light enucleation of the prostate, mainly due to the uh, hemostatic properties of the green light. And so I did a dozen cases, and hemostasis was uh, significantly better than it was with the homium YAG laser. However, as you all know, the green light laser is a side fire laser. And so uh, when you do a nucleation with a side fire laser, you have to use a lot more manual traction. And this I didn't appreciate. Uh, I, I found that I had to do a lot of manual traction uh, and my outcomes weren't as good as I would have liked. And so uh, after about 12 cases, I stopped and went back to HOLA. Uh, so the question now is how does a salty thulium fiber laser in nucleation of the prostate compare to these technologies um, that I've used in the past? So first of all, indications and contraindications. So indication obviously is men with bothersome lower urinary tract symptoms who have evidence of bladder outlet obstruction. Uh, gland size, uh, anywhere from 30 grams to I've put unlimited. So uh, to date, I've done 32 soul teeth through and fiber laser enucleations of the prostate. The largest I've done is 250 grams and really have had no issues uh, and feel that it is uh, just like any other nucleation um, uh, technique, and so I don't think there's a limitation to the prostate size. Anticoagulated, so I've done patients on aspirin uh, with SOLEP, and I've done patients uh, who've, who've had to stop their anticoagulation. I haven't yet done patients who can't stop their anticoagulation, uh, which I've previously done with the uh, homium YAG laser, and so I put it over here in contraindications with a question mark, uh, just because I haven't done it yet. But as you'll see, hemostasis is actually much better with the SOLEP thulium fiber laser, so uh, this should be an indication as well. So moving on to contraindications. So first of all, patients who are, uh, we'll go back here, Brian, for a sec. Uh, so patients who are unfit for surgery. Uh, so I'd like to mention here that the majority of my cases I do under regional anesthesia. Uh, so for uh, about 98% of my whole lips and all of my sole lips so far have all been un done under regional anesthesia. The only time I put patients under general anesthesia is if uh, they want to be under general anesthesia or if uh, the, per the procedure will take longer than three hours. Uh, if not, uh, you know, inupation works very well uh, a a with regional anesthesia. Um, obviously, patients who can't be placed in the dorsal lithotomy position, 
Again, as mentioned, patients who can't stop their anticoagulation or those with bleeding diathesis, I haven't done this yet with the sole teeth laser, and so I can't yet recommend it. Prostate cancer, so last, uh, last week I did my first patient with low-grade prostate cancer who was in retention. Uh, so I don't, I think this is indicated. Uh, I don't think it's contraindicated. Obviously it's not to treat the prostate cancer, but in those patients with low-grade prostate cancer and in retention, you can easily perform a sole teeth fluid fiber laser enucleation of the prostate. And then finally, patients who want to maintain their anterograde ejaculation. I mention this because, um, you know, after enucleation, they will not be able to maintain their anterograde ejaculation. So if a patient really wants to maintain their anterograde ejaculation, uh, I refer them to uh, another technique or another uh, procedure um, because they won't have any after enucleation. All right, so we're going to move on now to STOLA. So here you can see, uh, here's the, uh, the machine, uh, the, the sole teeth clean fiber laser, very small. Laser fiber actually has an RIF code, so you can actually load laser fiber yourself, which is very nice. Um, you can see here the flat screen uh, panel, which you can use to, uh, you know, adjust your parameters. Um, you can also save your own personal parameters uh, within the machine, so uh, it's very user-friendly uh, and um, very easy to use. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the studies that are out there on thulium fiber laser and new patient of the prostate. I want to mention here that, um, you know, the thulium fiber laser technology is quite new. Uh, in North America, there's, it's probably been here for about six to eight months. Um, however, there's an individual by the, do by the name of Dr. Enkev uh, from Russia who actually um, has had the laser for a number of years, um, I think since 2015. Uh, I mentioned this just because you'll see that, uh, you know, the, the studies that are, are, are coming out now are all, all from his institution. He's, you know, gotten a, a head start on all of us. So the first study is a prospective study comparing thulium fiber laser nucleation of the prostate uh, to uh, TURP. So this is a study uh, with um, 50 patients in each arm. Uh, average gland size was 60 grams in both arms. Um, in terms of uh, prostate size reduction, it was reduced by 80% in the thulium fiber laser nucleation group compared to the TURP group with 70%. Surgery time was slightly longer in the thulium fiber laser nucleation group. Uh, it took seven minutes longer. Catheterization time and hospital stay both favored the thulium fiber laser and nucleation group. Uh, and then PSA drop also favored the thulium fiber laser and nucleation group compared to the TERP group. Looking at the drop in IPSS and the increase in uh, flow, um, both favored the thulium fiber laser and nucleation group, but were not statistically significant. Uh, next slide. So the next study is a retrospective study. This is a study, again, by Dr. Enkev, comparing thulium fiber laser and nucleation of the prostate to open simple prostatectomy. Um, so this study uh, was done from 2015 to 2017. Uh, there were 40 patients who underwent open simple prostatectomy and 90 who underwent thulium fiber laser and nucleation of the prostate. Average gland size was uh, between 115 and 130 grams in both arms. Um, move to the next slide. Yeah, next slide again. Um, here you can see the amount, the amount of resected tissue was about 100 grams in both arms. Um, looking at hospital stay and catheterization time, both favored the thulium fiber laser and nucleation group. Uh, in terms of hemoglobin drop, again, this favored the thulium fiber laser and nucleation group. The last study I'm going to show you um, is a very nice study, again, done by Dr. Enkev, where he compared Three, the learning curve of three enucleation um, technologies. So first, he compared homium YAG laser to thulium fiber laser enucleation of the prostate uh, to monopolar enucleation of the prostate. Yes, there's individuals doing monopolar enucleation of the prostate. Those who don't have a laser uh, still want to perform enucleation, and so they use their, uh, their monopolar technology. So this study, uh, what they did was they had 30 patients in each group. They had three surgeons who had no experience with enucleation. They had a minimum of 60 uh, TERPs. They had a minimum experience of 60 TERPs. Again, no experience with enucleation. And they were randomized. These three surgeons were randomized to learn one of the three techniques, either uh, homium laser enucleation of the prostate, thulium fiber laser enucleation of the prostate, or monopolar enucleation of the prostate. And it was a mentor-based learning. So they, first of all, watched training videos. Uh, then each surgeon uh, assisted on five cases done by their mentor. Then each surgeon performed 10 cases with their mentor present in the operating room. Thereafter, the mentor was no longer present in the operating room, but was available if necessary. 
So if you look at a nucleation, so first of all, uh, prostate gland size was between 55 and 60 grams in all three groups. Preoperative parameters were also very similar between the three arms. Now, if you look at a nucleation efficiency on this graph, you can see that at about 15 cases, uh, the nucleation of the thulium fiber laser actually increased. Can we go to the next slide? So if you look at this graph at about 15 cases, the uh, enucleation of the thulium fiber laser, the efficiency of the enucleation of the thulium fiber laser increased significantly greater than the homium YAG uh, enucleation of the prostate and the monopolar enucleation of the prostate. Next slide. So if you can see, it's, it was actually statistically significantly greater, that, that is to say the enucleation efficiency in the thulium fiber laser enucleation group compared to the other groups. Um, in terms of catheterization time, hospital stay, hemoglobin drop and uh, sodium decrease were all very similar between the sodium fiber laser enucleation group and the homium laser enucleation of, uh, of the prostate group. Uh, and these were both uh, significantly better than the monopolar enucleation group. What this uh, study determined was that um, it was a little bit faster to learn sodium fiber laser enucleation of the prostate. And the second thing that it uh, concluded was that the hardest step was really um, uh, maintaining that enucleation plane uh, and we'll talk about that when we get to the videos, and I'll, I'll try to give you some tips and tricks. So how do I perform a sole teeth thulium fiber laser enucleation of the prostate? First of all, fiber size. I use the same fiber as I use for uh, the homium uh, YAG or the uh, hole-up procedure, so 550 microns. In terms of settings, so I've tried all different settings. I've tried low energy, high energy. I've tried low frequency, high frequency. Uh, I've tried short pulse and I've tried long pulse. And these are what I think are the best parameters in order to do an enucleation procedure. For enucleation, I use one joule and 60 hertz with a short pulse. And for hemostasis, I use one joule and 30 hertz with the long pulse. Now, the uh, pulses, uh, I started off using the long pulse. The problem with the long pulse is it creates bubbles at the end of the laser fiber. Uh, and this can be distracting when you're doing enucleation. Uh, so that's why I use the short pulse. For hemostasis, I actually like these bubbles. I feel like they help with hemostasis, and I'll show you a video to support this. And so for hemostasis, I use the long pulse. So let's get into uh, enucleation. So if you want to perform an enucleation uh, with the salty exclusion fiber, first thing you're going to need, obviously, is a video tower and a camera. You need a salty uh, laser. You need a 550 micron salty laser fiber. You need a 26 French or a 24 French continuous flow resectoscope sheet with modified inner sheets containing a, a laser fiber stabilizing bridge, a 30 degree cystoscopic lens, a laser fiber stabilizing catheter. I don't, um, this is, I still use this. I use this with all my whole lips uh, because there's a lot of vibration with the homium YAG, which we don't have uh, with the sole teeth thulium fiber. Uh, and so I probably don't need it, but for the moment I'm still using this catheter. You need a long nephroscope for morcellation, you need a morcellator, and then you need a catheter, a uh, three-way catheter at the end of the procedure. So steps of the procedure. First step is uh, finding the plane and doing your apical dissection. Uh, I also do a uh, sphincter adenoma separation, uh, which I'm not gonna actually talk about. It's more of an advanced technique, uh, but we can talk about it at the end of my presentation if, if people are interested. Uh, once you've gone over the top, you've done your apical dissection, you then wanna uh, go proximally and enter into your bladder. Uh, once you've done that, you want to cut the prostate in two. Um, I like to do an anterior commissure, and then if there's a median lobe, I'll do a five o'clock groove or a seven o'clock groove. If there's no median lobe, I'll just do a six o'clock groove. Uh, there is some interest in doing an end block technique, which I've done. An end block technique basically means that you don't separate the prostate in two. Um, it saves you about five to seven minutes. Uh, and to be honest, um, I don't do it for two reasons. The first is I like to maintain the bladder neck. Uh, and if you want to do an end block technique, especially with those bigger prostates, you're going to have to incise the bladder neck. Uh, and the second reason uh, I don't do it is uh, because I just find it much easier uh, to push the prostate into the bladder when it's two uh, lobes, as opposed to trying to push the whole thing into the bladder. So once you split the prostate in two, the next step is lateral and posterior lobe enucleation. So we're going to get into the video. Uh, the first video I'm going to show you is um, apical dissection. Actually, no. The first video I'm going to show you is, uh, hold on a second, is, is how to find the plane. This is a crucial step in enucleation. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's really important to be able to find the plane of enucleation. We go, yes, so this is a 110-gram prostate. Uh, I'm going to show you here's the Vera Montanum. Here is the sphincter. So I like to start my enucleation about one to two centimeters proximal to the Vera Montanum. 
The reason why I like to start here is because I find it's the best and easiest way to find the plane of a nucleation. So you basically start one or two centimeters proximal to the Vera Montanum, and you keep cutting until you start seeing the plane, which we can actually already see there, but it'll, it'll show itself even better in a sec here. Um, so a couple of things to uh, notice, first of all, is I'm using a no-touch technique. You can see the laser doesn't actually touch the tissue. I'm about two to three millimeters away from the tissue. Um, and this helps a lot uh, in reducing any uh, charring or carbonization, which we'll talk about later on in the video. Um, so first of all, you can find your plane one to two millimeters, uh, one to two centimeters, proximal to the rear montanum. If not, you can go where the lateral lobe hits the floor of the prostate, which I'm doing here. That's the second place you can find the, uh, the plane of a nucleation. So right where the lateral lobe hits the floor of the prostate, if you cut the mucosa there, it's very easy again to find that plane of a nucleation. It's also very important to cut the mucosa and not just push into the mucosa. If you push into the mucosa, it'll end up tearing behind you distally into the sphincter. So you wanna cut the mucosa before you push. Again, here I'm using the no touch technique and you can see the tissue is splitting very nicely along the plane of a nucleation. Uh, also, you, you hopefully can appreciate that there's very little bleeding. Every once in a while, I'll do some spot hemostasis, but for the most part, with the sulfium thulium fiber, hemostasis takes care of itself. So once you've found the plane of a nucleation, the next step is to do your apical dissection. So this is the same prostate that I just showed you, uh, and we're gonna start basically start moving up the side of the prostate. So I'm manually pushing on the lobe above and just cutting between the lobe and the capsule. Uh, and you basically wanna do that nice and slow, moving up towards 12 o'clock. Every once in a while, I'll do some hemostasis as you can see. But again, I do a little bit of manual traction on the prostate, separating it from the capsule. And then I cut the attachments of the lobe from the capsule. You're gonna see there's a, a few gaps in the video, but that's where I'm doing the separation of the sphincter from the adenoma. Um, again, a little bit of hemostasis, no touch technique, and you can see there's very little charring, uh, and more importantly, uh, very easy to see the difference between the capsule and the prostate. So you're gonna move up towards uh, ideally uh, 12 o'clock, uh, and then we're gonna to head towards the bladder. Um, so these are the two most important steps of enucleation, finding the plane of enucleation and doing the apical dissection because the sphincter is not far behind it. If you're able to find the plane of enucleation, and if you're able to do the apical dissection, you're able to do an enucleation. The rest of the procedure is actually quite easy. Um, so here, again, I'm almost up at 12 o'clock, uh, just uh, separating out um, uh, capsule, uh, sorry, prostate from capsule. So once you get up over the top, uh, the next step is basically to head proximally towards the bladder. You can move on to the next video, Brian. So as mentioned, you should, uh, so now we're going, uh, yeah. okay, so, um, here we are going towards the bladder. So the question is, how do you identify the bladder? Uh, it's very easy. You'll eventually see uh, the fibers attaching the prostate to uh, the bladder neck, which I'll show you here in a sec, and they'll be going perpendicular, so up and down. Um, you'll see them here in a sec, uh, right here, and I'll freeze it for you. Uh, so once you see those perpendicular fibers, you know that the bladder is on the other side of these, uh, these fibers. Uh, so basically, if you cut at that point, you're going to enter into the bladder. Um, so very importantly, as you all know, bladder neck is usually the place that usually likes to bleed. Um, so really important to do good hemostasis here. Uh, the good thing is that with uh, the salty sulin fiber laser, uh, hemostasis really takes care of itself. As you can see, there's very little bleeding. Um, but again, I like to be very aggressive here. I like to maintain that bladder neck, but I like to uh, remove all the attachments of the prostate from the bladder neck uh, while uh, having good hemostasis. So there's two ways to do an enucleation. The first is by cutting, so using laser energy. And the second is uh, using manual traction. Uh, and I'm gonna show you both of those here now. Um, I like to do more laser energy, but uh, both techniques uh, are, are appropriate depending on the situation. Uh, so the first thing here, if you, if you uh, watch the video, I'm going to peel this prostate off of the bladder neck as I'm doing here with laser energy. So the bladder neck is above us and I'm just cutting, it, uh, cutting the prostate off of the bladder neck. Now, 
The other thing you can do is manual traction. So you'll see it here in a sec. The problem with doing manual traction is that once you push, it peels off the bladder neck, but then it bleeds. So um, then you have to go back and do hemostasis. So I've learned that by using laser energy up front, I basically do hemostasis and I cut the prostate off of the capsule and the bladder neck all in one go. And so it saves me some time. So over the years, I've basically gone from lots of manual traction and little laser energy to more laser energy and less manual traction. Okay, so once we've uh, entered into the bladder, the next step is to uh, cut the prostate in two. Um, so the first thing we do here is, uh, here I'm doing a five o'clock route, even though the, the median lobe is very small. I identify the ureteral orifice. Um, and then I uh, cut a groove at five o'clock. Uh, so you can do, again, if there's a median lobe, you do a five o'clock or a seven o'clock groove. Um, if there's no median lobe, you can do a six o'clock groove. I often get the question, you know, how do I find the capsule when I'm doing my groove? Uh, so there's a number of ways. First of all, you can look at the tissue. Here it's clear that there's a lot of BPH tissue here, so I can cut down until I find the capsule. Second way is by looking into the bladder, uh, and that will help you gauge the depth that you can go. Uh, and then the third way is basically joining this incision with your um, first incision that you made proximal to the vera montanum. And I'll show you that here in a sec. Uh, but here I'm almost uh, getting to the capsule, but again, there is some tissue here. Uh, so I just keep cutting down and I'm gonna go distally to where I started my incision, uh, proximal to the vera montana, which you'll see here in a sec. Um, and when I see that, which I just did see it, um, I know how deep I can go. I'll show it to you again here in a sec. Um, uh, and because you did, there it is. So now I know how deep I can go uh, and I can be a little bit more aggressive uh, making this groove um, uh, down to the capsule. Um, so a couple of things here. Again, uh, here I'm using less of a no-touch technique because uh, I'm just really trying to get down to the capsule. Um, so I'm not too really worried about any carbonization or charring. Um, the other thing is you want to really nicely identify this. It just makes the rest of the procedure a lot easier. Um, and, you know, I do some hemostasis, but again, you can see that hemostasis is actually uh, quite good. So once we get down to capsule here, we could probably move on to the next video. Uh, so here we go. We're going to go back uh, through the urethra, uh, and we're going to um, look up, and we can actually see the plane that we've already created when we went into the bladder. And now we're just going to split the prostate in two. Uh, it's very easy here because um, we know uh, we're cutting into the plane we've already created. Uh, so it's really easy uh, to determine how deep we need to go. Um, if there's ever any problems, which you'll see, uh, I can also just move side to side and that'll actually split the anterior commissure for me. Um, I'm going to show you here also, people always ask, you know, how do you know you're not cutting into the sphincter? I've actually already separated the sphincter from the adenoma and I'm going to show you that here in a sec. Uh, so you know how far uh, you can go uh, and not damage that sphincter. So we're going to come distally here uh, and I can see the end of my adenoma and right above is the sphincter. So I point my laser fiber down and away from the sphincter uh, and then I can just basically cut the anterior commissure. During this case, I felt that I was a little bit close to the sphincter. So as you'll see in a sec, I go back in and actually I split that anterior commissure just by moving my scope laterally uh, and medially. So right here, I'm going to go uh, back and forth, right and left. And that splits basically that anterior commissure. Uh, and then there's just a little bit of tissue left uh, to split the prostate into, which I do again uh, away from the sphincter uh, downwards. So once you've done the anterior commissure, we've uh, done the six o'clock or five o'clock groove, the prostate is basically split in two. Uh, and all that's left now is to finish up the enucleation and push the lobe uh, into the prostate. Uh, so that's what I'll show you here. Uh, on this next video is basically just completing the enucleation. Uh, so I like to complete the enucleation by going lateral to medial. So obviously from the plane that I've already created, uh, uh, going towards uh, the uh, medial aspect of the prostate. Um, and it's really very easy now because uh, most of it's already done. I mention uh, here that I'm very aggressive uh, at the bladder neck uh, because I had a case where I left a little bit of tissue at the bladder neck. And actually, I'll show you the video of that. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty aggressive at the bladder neck. I'd like to maintain the bladder neck, but I don't have to leave any tissue on the bladder neck.
Uh, so basically what you do is it's very easy. As you can see, uh, you can use the no touch technique. Uh, you can do manual traction now. Uh, this is actually the point where I like to hand off to my residents when they're starting off the nucleation uh, because, uh, you know, all the uh, more um, delicate parts, you know, close to the sphincter are done. Um, so every once in a while, you'll see I'll do a little bit of hemostasis. Uh, but for the most part, uh, with the new technology, the hemostasis takes care of itself. Um, another thing I'd like to mention is burn back. Um, so for those who do uh, HOLEP, uh, you know that uh, you have to strip the fiber about an inch or two um, at the beginning of the case. Uh, so whenever I do a HOLEP, I strip the laser fiber about one to two inches uh, because there's a tremendous amount of burn back uh, with the homium YAG laser. With the uh, Solti Thulium Fiber Laser, uh, the manufacturer gives you about a centimeter or a centimeter and a half uh, of fiber that's stripped. Uh, and I've never had to strip more of the fiber. And I've never, in the 32 cases that I've done, I've never had to uh, use a second uh, thulium fiber uh, for one enucleation case, even the 250 gram prostate that I did. Um, so once I've gone lateral to medial to a certain amount, I'll then go posteriorly and start lifting up the prostate uh, and pushing it up into the bladder. Um, here again, uh, using the no touch technique, uh, the prostate really just dissects itself out. Um, uh, from the capsule. There's probably about uh, a minute left on this video. Um, if there were any questions, Brian, I could take them. Uh, I think it's nice to see here, you know, just with the no technique, no touch technique, how uh, the prostate easily splits from the capsule. Uh, you can do a little bit of hemostasis, obviously, but uh, for the most part, uh, it's, uh, it's fairly simple at this point. Dr. Bojani, one, one question here. In your learning curve of Soltiv, uh, have you has your percentages changed in terms of how often you do manual dissection versus how much you're using the laser for for cutting? Yeah, so uh, definitely, like uh, I, I definitely has changed from my initial enucleation experience, uh, and even within uh, using Solti. The biggest um, change with Solti to and fiber laser is going from um, touching the tissue to not touching the tissue. Um, but I've also changed uh, from uh, manual traction uh, to more lasing. Um, so I do a lot more laser energy than I did before. Um, but uh, really, there is there is a learning curve, understanding how the laser works. Uh, and I think one of the biggest things is, you know, try to not touch the tissue. You know, you want to stay uh, uh, two or three millimeters away from the tissue. Um, you know, you don't get any of the charring, carbonization, and you get that nice separation of the uh, prostate uh, from the capsule. There it is, the lobes in the, pro in, the uh, in the bladder. So once you push these two lobes in the bladder, uh, the, the next step is, of course, uh, morselation. You can't do a nucleation without morselation. Uh, I just want to mention here real quick, uh, you know, the old morselator, there was some danger with the old morselator. But with the newer morselators, these um, oscillating morselators, there's really no danger uh, for two reasons. One, the older morselator would go back and forth, and so you could possibly take a part of the bladder. Here, uh, you have an oscillating morselator, and the opening is much smaller than the older morselator. So if you wanted to damage the bladder, you'd actually have to turn the morselator upside down and go towards the bladder. Two important things when you're doing morselation. One is you want to have, want to have a full bladder. Uh, and so for that, I have two inflows. I have no outflow. The only outflow is coming from the mouth of my morselator. And the second important thing is hemostasis. You want to have good visualization. And this is one of the main reasons that I like uh, the salty thulium fiber laser because hemostasis is so good uh, and it takes care of itself. When I was doing HOLEP, at the end of my nucleation, before I went to morselation, I had to do five to 10 minutes of hemostasis. Once I complete morselation, I'd have to do another five minutes of, mor of hemostasis. I don't have to do that anymore. With the salty thulium fiber laser, hemostasis is perfect at the end of a nucleation. I can go straight to morselation and then I can basically go straight to putting in my catheter. Okay, so um, what are the advantages of uh, Solti thulium fiber laser? Um, so hemostasis is significantly better than with the homium YAG laser. Next slide. So the reasons for this is uh, there's a number of reasons. First of all, as mentioned, um, the thulium fiber laser is significantly uh, greater or has a much higher water absorption. Uh, it also has a lower peak pressure and has a longer pulse width. What this means is that the energy is spread over a larger amount of tissue it's shallower in its depth of penetration, and there's a greater absorption in water. And this all leads to better hemostasis. Next slide. With the homium YAG laser, you have a, a deeper penetration, you have a higher peak pressure, you have a shorter pulse width, and you have less absorption in water. 
And for these reasons, hemostasis is significantly better with the Solti Thulium Fiber Laser. Next slide. Oh, the video. So this, uh, this is just a quick video showing that bubble hemostasis that I had mentioned previously. And so when I do hemostasis, I use that long pulse. And you'll see here at the end of the laser fiber, you can see those bubbles, um, which uh, I find distracting when I do a nucleation, but I actually like them for hemostasis. And you'll see it here and again. The other thing that, uh, another advantage that I find with the Solti Thulium Fiber Laser is its versatility. Um, it's a laser that, uh, yeah, you can play this video. So it cuts extremely well. Although it's really good for nucleation and helps uh, it really easy to separate the tissue, uh, the prostate from the capsule, uh, it also cuts extremely well. So here's a little bit of access tissue on the anterior capsule. Uh, with the Soul Teeth laser, you're able to cut it off uh, extremely well. I'm gonna also show you that video. It plays simultaneously, or it plays right after this one, uh, basically showing the access tissue at the bladder neck that I had mentioned. Uh, that I had in one of my cases, and you'll see how easy it is to cut that tissue off. Um, the other reason I like the fact that it can cut so well is in smaller prostate glands. For those of you who have done HOLEP, you know that a 100-gram prostate is a lot easier than a 50-gram prostate. The reason for that is a 100-gram prostate has had the time to basically uh, push on the capsule and create a nice plane of enucleation. The smaller glands of 50 gram prostate is not that big. It hasn't had time to create that nice uh, enucleation plane. And so with HOLEP, I actually dread doing those smaller glands. But now with, uh, with the Soul Teeth Thulium Fiber Laser, uh, even those small prostates uh, don't cause any problems. Very easy to do, uh, just like those larger glands because it cuts so well, as you can see uh, from this video uh, here. So a little bit of access tissue at the bladder neck probably wouldn't have had any impact clinically, but um, you know, once in a nucleator, always in a nucleator, you wanna to try to get out all that, uh, all that tissue. I learned that from Dr. Lingman. So yeah, you just, just cut off this tissue and, and you can see very easy to, to remove excess tissue. We can move on to the next slide, um, Brian. Another advantage of the Sulfi Suvin Fiber Laser is for bladder stones. Um, so it uh, treats bladder stones extremely well and extremely fast. Um, so uh, previously, when I would have a bladder stone greater than two centimeters, I would do the systolithal opaxy separate from my nucleation. But now with the Solti Fluid Fiber Laser, I can do a two centimeter stone in about 10 minutes. And so I'm able to do two, three, and four centimeter stones at the same time as my nucleation procedure. Uh, and so that's another advantage of the Solti Fluid Fiber Laser. A quick word on carbonization. Uh, so, um, as mentioned, uh, first of all, there's no clinical impact of carbonization, but many people have found this difficult, this, this charring or carbonization with the thulium fiber laser. Um, and so, the, the problem with the charring or the, the carbonization is that it can distract you from the plane of the nucleation. And so, what I recommend, next, uh, Brian, is to really use that no-touch technique. As you saw in the videos, if you use the no-touch technique, uh, you won't get the carbonization. You'll be able to stay on that nucleation plane a lot easier, uh, and you'll have a, a lot more fun doing the procedure. Um, here's just a, a quick video showing uh, prosthetic fossa uh, right at the end of a nucleation. So as you can see, uh, really the hemostasis here it is. So here's the end of a nucleation. Uh, there's really very little bleeding. Um, you know, here's the the, the, the sphincter still intact. Um, and so, uh, you know, these are the results you can get uh, when you do a nucleation with a salty thulium fiber laser, even with these smaller glands. So how do you get started if you want to do a nucleation with a salty thulium fiber laser? First of all, is watch videos. Uh, I highly recommend watching a, a number of videos. Speak to someone who's done it before. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to speak to anybody who wants to get some tips or tricks. Uh, also, it's really nice to talk to someone after you started doing a nucleation, uh, just so you can kind of bounce some ideas off them and, uh, you know, talk about where you had difficulties. I highly recommend starting with a larger gland, anything between 80 and 120 grams. Uh, it's just much easier to find that enucleation plane and stay on that enucleation plane. Uh, ideally, you want to do somebody with uh, no catheter uh, and no infection, obviously, just less inflammation, less bleeding. Uh, so overall, the new Solti Fluid Fiber Laser gives you, uh, you know, uh, an excellent treatment of uh, stones, uh, as has been shown in many other webinars and many other presentations. Uh, but in my opinion, um, I, I truly believe that uh, salty thulium fiber laser in nucleation uh, is where we're going to see the most benefit with this technology. Uh, uh, I've truly enjoyed the last 32 cases. 
um, because of the advantages that, that I've spoken about. Vaporization data is still pending. So really with this laser, you get best of both worlds, the best treatment for stone disease and the best treatment for a BPH. Uh, so in conclusion, endoscopic nucleation of the prostate, there's many different energy sources. Uh, I hope I've been able to express the advantages of the new soul teeth cooling fiber laser, um, its uh, hemostatic uh, properties, its versatility, its ability to treat bladder stones very easily and very quickly, uh, the shorter learning curve, uh, and then getting started, you want to try something around 100 grams. Um, so just before I leave you uh, with that and, and take your questions, uh, here is the third case that I've done. This was done last week, a 72-year-old gentleman with a 126-gram prostate, uh, salt teeth, tooling, fiber, laser, nucleation of the prostate. Inucleation time was 38 minutes. Morselation time was 10 minutes. Uh, here is his urine off irrigation. Patient left same day of surgery, four hours postoperatively. Uh, this is the third such case I've done. Um, you know, I've never, I was never able to do same day surgery with, uh, with the homium YAG laser, uh, and now I'm doing it regularly. So with that, uh, I thank you again for, uh, for being here and uh, happy to take any of your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Bergeni. Great job. And uh, we do have a few questions uh, uh, from the attendees. Uh, I'll start with this one. Uh, do previous TERPs, green lights, or other BPH procedures change how well the adenoma peels from the capsule? In your opinion. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely not. So I've done a number of patients post, uh, post TERP, post green light, um, post uh, monopolar bipolar TERP, I've done post um, resume, I've done post uh, Euroleft, I've done post um, microwave even. Um, it, it really doesn't change anything because none of these procedures or extremely rarely do they get to capsule. It's very, very rare. Sometimes they'll get there anteriorly uh, or really posteriorly at the six o'clock area, but uh, uh, really doesn't change much at all. Okay, and uh, another question. How does carbonization affect you uh, when the plane is sticky or when you have nodules? Um, so um, have no issues with nodules. Um, uh, sticky planes, uh, really not an issue. Um, I guess, I guess the, the question is basically referring to the fact that if it's sticky, you're going to use more laser energy and you're going to touch the tissue more maybe and have more carbonization. Uh, to be honest, I haven't had any issues with carbonization. I did at the beginning of my learning curve, and this is something I've seen uh, on Twitter and a number of people who have started doing uh, nucleation with a salt teeth cooling fiber laser. Uh, they're getting into this charring and carbonization. Uh, but as soon as I learned to stay uh, you know, a few millimeters away from the tissue, it really hasn't been an issue. Like, the, the, there's been probably after about eight to 10 cases, uh, I haven't had any issues. Excellent. And um, uh, another question, uh, what percent have you done same day, uh, same day discharge? Uh, so uh, uh, every single one so far, but I've only done three. So um, <laughs> three, three, uh, three so far. Um, I haven't um, uh, not done it, I guess. Uh, so most, uh, all my patients now is same day discharge. Uh, unless there's uh, some, something wrong or something, something uh, I've decided to keep them. Excellent. And um, uh, you mentioned that you were toggling between dissection and, and hemostasis. Um, and the question is, are you, are you just toggling between two pedals? Yes, that's right. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. Yeah. So with the new sole sol teeth tooling fiber laser, there's two pedals. Uh, it's really nice. One for enucleation, one for hemostasis. Um, and uh, again, I, you just kind of have to do spot hemostasis. Um, most of the rest of it takes care of itself. Great. Um, and Another question here for you, uh, Dr. Bojani. What would you say to a, and you kind of already have addressed this, but I guess asking the question again and, and to frame it up a different way, what would you say to a surgeon that is just um, uh, a championing a, a high-powered homium YAG laser for a nucleation? They've done it, and, and, they're, and they're, um, they're really skeptical about and fiber laser and how it could make a difference uh, in their practice. What would you say to that, that surgeon? So I, I think the most important thing that I can say um, is um, if you're going to try it, give it at least 10 cases. Like, I don't think it's fair to try a new technology and say, I'm going to do two cases and look, it doesn't work. It's not giving any benefit. Forget about it. I'm telling you, I, I, I truly believe that we're scratching the surface with this laser. Um, and I'm telling you, after about five to seven cases, 
uh, you're going to really enjoy it. Um, there's really, I mean, I did, I did a thousand whole lips. I, I know what, I know where you're coming from. Um, but you got, you got to give it about, you know, you know, eight, 10 cases, uh, really understand how the technology works, get used to how it's working. Just try to remember, uh, when you were learning with the Homium YAG laser, you know, you, you got to understand the laser doesn't work the same way. Uh, unfortunately there is this, you know, learning curve. It's not a long learning curve. Um, and your, your outcomes will be good, but, uh, regardless, but um, you'll really start enjoying it. In my opinion, you'll, you'll really start enjoying it. Uh, another question here: Are there are there any ej ejaculatory duck sparring te sparing techniques that you use? Uh, it's a great question. Um, I don't, you know, um, I haven't tried them. Uh, I I truly believe that if somebody really wants to maintain their anterior ejaculation and and there are a lot of patients um, who want to maintain their anterior ejaculation. Um, uh, you know, I think they should, you should refer them to another, uh, uh, another technique, in my opinion. Uh, there's, you know, a number of other procedures they could have done uh, that will maintain their anterior ejaculation. So that is an important question, in my opinion. Uh, and if patients really want to maintain their anterior ejaculation, there is a trade-off, obviously, the other techniques. There's a, uh, you know, a, a much higher re-intervention rate. Uh, but, but as long as you speak to your patients, explain to them the advantages and the disadvantages, uh, you know, I think that you'll come up with the a shared decision making that, that, that makes sense for you and the patient. It, Dr. Bojani, speaking to your evolution and your approach with, with Sultiv and enucleation, could you kind of project where do you think you're, you're going in terms of, um, you know, in, in, uh, your, your learning curve and, and new knowledge and new technique and maybe new energy settings that you may uncover? Um, I guess yeah. bringing that question another way, where do you think you are in your personal learning curve, and do you think there's even room for more efficiency? I think there is. I really do. Uh, I think I'm I'm pretty fast, uh, as you can see, 38 minutes uh, on a new creation of a pretty large gland. Um, getting faster, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting used to the the same day. The same day, I think, is a nice evolution. I think probably the next step would be removal of catheter on the same day of surgery as has been done. Uh, with other integration techniques. Uh, but first I'm gonna, you know, get the same day under my belt uh, and then we'll move on to removing the catheter same day. But uh, in terms of parameter changes, I, you know, I'm really comfortable where I am not, I'm at now. Um, am I gonna try something else? Honestly, it's going well. Uh, I, again, I've tried a lot of the parameters already. Uh, I've tried lower energy. Um, I've tried higher frequency, um, but I really like where I'm at. Uh, it's doing well. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm, there's, there's just so many other uh, opportunities here uh, in terms of uh, parameters. So probably I'll, I'll, I'll get going on trying some new parameters uh, when I'm comfortable with the, with the same day and, uh, and removal of catheter eventually. Well, I think you know, speaking from, from a perspective of a non-MD, uh, uh, you, you uh, certainly seem very fast and very efficient in your surgical approach. Speaking of fast and efficient, it is nine o'clock. We went through. 12 videos and a whole bunch of really dense content very succinctly in an hour. That's very impressive, uh, very detailed stuff. And uh, I think for everybody uh, on the call that may, may have missed something, we were recording this. The videos will be shared. The presentation will be shared. Dr. Bojani is very gracious to correspond with as well to, to provide guidance. And he's uh, certainly going to be a, a huge advocate for this technology and for coaching his peers in the future. So. Dr. Bojani, thank you for your efforts here tonight. A very, a very great, very well, uh, well done job tonight, and for your future efforts to uh, support Sultiv and, uh, and and continue educating all of us on prostate nucleation. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, uh, Mike. Thanks, uh, thanks to Olympus. Thanks to everybody who attended. It's been uh, it's been a pleasure and, uh, and a real joy for me to, to 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 share my experience. Have a good evening, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you, Dr. Bojani. Hey, Tommy. Great job, Dr. Virginia. Thank you so much. My pleasure, Mike.